Merry Christmas! Today we're going to be looking at some very festive images of the most miraculous birth announcement ever, the Annunciation. But before we dive too deeply into the art, I want to take just a little personal detour to talk about why these images are significant to me. So uh, a year and a half ago, my husband and I were told by the doctors that we had a 2%, only a 2% chance of ever having biological children. Um, this came after several years of struggling with infertility and was really punctuated by the fact that uh, we learned that as American expats living in the UK that um, the process of adoption would be very complicated and very expensive. But if that was the way forward, we were, you know, prepared and happy to do that. Um, but I just needed to shave off a little more of that 2% if possible. So we decided we'd do a single cycle of IVF knowing full well that, you know, 98% chance is not going to work. Um, so we went through IVF and it was horrible. <laughs> it was not fun. Um, I mean, besides the inconvenience of the daily blood tests and the internal sonograms and just all the medication that they make you take. But in the midst of all that darkness came this. And then this. This miraculous little conception we never thought possible was actually real. I mean, it seems so implausible at first. I mean, it's taken me months to believe, like, there's a little baby in here. Maybe because it's that time of the year, but um, as I've gone through this, it's made me think a lot about Mary and think about what it must have been like for her. You know, for me, I have had years to think about having children and working up to this idea of motherhood, and yet it's still difficult for me to, like, really believe, like, this is happening. And Mary was just a kid. She's just this little teenage virgin, and one day she's just suddenly pregnant. And you know, not just pregnant, but pregnant with God's baby. I mean, how do you deal with that? That's so much to take on. Um, it makes me think of this painting by Arthur Hacker. Uh, I don't know what his religious affiliation was, but uh, here's the painting. There are a couple reasons that I love this painting. I love the muted palette, the way Gabriel in his ethereal robes whispers this sweet secret into Mary's ear while holding a lily, a symbol of her virtue and virginity. But what I really love about this piece is Mary's face. It's in shadow and she almost seems haunted, like she's able to see what's in front of her. And when you think about it, she had so much that she was about to face. First, she'd have to tell her fiancé that she was pregnant which would likely mean that her engagement would be broken and her future prospects would be completely gone. And of course at this time, sexual sin of that nature would mean that her friends and neighbors would try to stone her. If she managed to survive that, she'd have a cross-country journey on the back of a donkey. She'd have to give birth in a barn, surrounded by animal feces. Then she'd have to flee for the life of her child. And you can imagine how difficult that would be for this young, provincial, probably kind of naive girl to suddenly be in this pagan metropolis of Egypt. So this expression of fear, resolve, and anticipation on Mary's face in this painting is very much warranted. And yet, there is this grace to the image, the juxtaposition of her delicate sweeping robes and youthful posture with this dark expression gives a sort of balance. This centralized focus on Mary and her personal emotive response to what's going on in this moment is something that really seems to resonate with Mormon artists. Uh, there are several LDS painters that have even completely foregone depicting Gabriel at all and just focus on Mary. We can see this in examples by Connie Lynn Riley, Denna McMurdy, James Christensen, and Joseph Brickley. Notice this last one again uses Mary's traditional symbol of the lily. In traditional Christian iconography, scenes of the Annunciation are shown with Mary, usually wearing red with a blue mantle, kneeling on the ground in a posture of awe and reverence. And Gabriel is often floating somewhere up above as a sexless winged being whose head is surrounded by a halo. A beam of light, sometimes with a dove, shines down on Mary, symbolizing her conception by the Spirit. The few depictions that we have of the Annunciation from Mormon artists generally tend to forego all of these traditional elements that aren't explicitly laid out in the Bible. 
For example, here are two relatively well-known LDS depictions. The first is by John Scott, the other by Walter Rain. In both of these pieces, extraneous symbolism is gone. There are no lilies to be seen. Scott's Mary keeps the traditional blue, though completely clothed Mary in it, while Rain's Mary is clothed in white. Both have veiled heads. There is no attempt by either artist to conflate Gabriel's announcement with Mary's conception. In both images, Gabriel is a wingless male and surrounded by light, but without a halo. While most Christian theology suggests that angels don't necessarily have a sex, which is why most angels sort of have this vaguely effeminate look to them, Mormon theology has strong feelings on the subject. Mormons see angels as either pre- or post-mortal beings, which maintain whatever sex they had on earth. In 1839, the church's founder, Joseph Smith, declared that Gabriel was actually Noah of the Old Testament, thereby resolving the question of the angel's gender. But masculinity isn't seen the same by everyone. Annie Henry Nader's version of the Annunciation has a much more feminized Gabriel. The angel's delicate jaw and slender shoulders certainly make the being more approachable for the young Jewish virgin. One of my favorite depictions by a Mormon artist of the Annunciation was by J. Kirk Richards. In this piece, we see the spirit bringing the soul of Jesus to Mary's womb. There are several really lovely things about this painting. For one, Richards is obviously well acquainted with traditional Christian painting. The stage of the painting is set with a relatively narrow depth of field, with a window giving us a small glint into where we find ourselves. Mary kneels on a patterned floor in prayer with her traditional colors and veil. The spirit carries the infant Jesus, whose head is surrounded by a halo of light, which seems to be the source of nearly all the light in the painting. There are really two elements of this painting that really distinguish it doctrinally from other Christian paintings on the same theme. First, the spirit is shown as a person and not a dove. It's quite rare for the spirit to be shown with a human-like form. And second, we see the pre-mortal Christ. That's a big deal because Christ's pre-mortality has long been a point of doctrinal dispute. Back in the early Renaissance, there were some Annunciation paintings that were sort of similar to Richard's painting. They showed a naked baby Jesus shooting down from heaven towards Mary. He'd often be following a dove and have a cross over his shoulder, symbolizing his eternal sacrifice. These images were already on the verge of being a problem, as the church had already declared spiritual preexistence a heresy all the way back in 553 AD. But Jesus' premortality still seemed to be up in the air a little bit, and people kept making these images until finally, Pope Benedict XIV put his foot down. Since then, we don't see paintings like this, which I think makes it all the more fascinating. So I want to wish everyone a very Merry Christmas. If you enjoyed this video, please share it with your friends. Also, be sure to subscribe. The more subscribers that we have, the more that we can prove that the Mormon arts have a significant place in the world today. So make sure to click the little button to subscribe. Also, I will be off for the holidays, so our next episode will air in mid-January. So be watching out for that, and we'll see you then. Bye-bye.